Drives the right side. This is... He just drills a three right in his mug. The Sports Hub Celtic Show. Hots it up for Porzingis. With Chris Casper and Jim Murray. Brought to you by Shaw's at Star Market, Bentley University, Direct Federal Credit Union, and Jack's Abbey on 98.5 The Sports Hub. 1986, the last time the Celtics made the conference finals, only losing two games. It's become a rite of spring in Boston. Derek White dribbles into the front court, and the final seconds will tick off the clock. For the sixth time in eight years, and the third year in a row, the Boston Celtics are going to the Eastern Conference Finals. First in offense, first in scoring margin, first in net rating, first to clinch a playoff spot, first to 40 wins, first to 50 wins, first to 60 wins. Tonight, they're the first to reach the Final Four. The final score in Game 5, Boston 113, Cleveland 98. And welcome into the Sports Hub Celtics show. Celtics are off to, off to the Eastern Conference Final. And Sean Grandy there rattling off a lot of firsts for the Celtics this year. And as the guys in green make their playoff run, Dedham Savings is here for the journey. Yours too. Go to DedhamSavings.com. Member FDIC. Member DIF. Again, this is a Sports Up Celtics show with uh, yours truly, Jim Murray, Chris Gaskard, Brian Robb back with us. B. Robb, who's been covering the Celtics for Mass Live, been on the road in Cleveland and, and awaiting where his travel will take him next. Will it be Indianapolis, uh, home of the Pacers, uh, or New York City at Madison Square Garden, home of the Knicks? Those, uh, those two will play a Game 7. The Eastern Conference Final will tip off Tuesday night. At TD Garden, I will say, you know, and I tweeted this last night, and I feel like some people were confused by it. Like, what's this tweet supposed to mean? I I said, you know, watching some of that uh, game six between the Pacers and Knicks, it's one of the things that's always bugged me as a sports fan, no matter what sport we're talking about. When you have like a seven-game series where only the home team wins, and I know in that series the first two games were very competitive. But the rest have been trash and, and, and complete blowouts. I am a, It offends my sensibilities, guys, <laughs> when teams can only win in the playoffs at home and you still get a seven-game series out of it. This reminds me of uh, Bruins and, not to quote sports, but Bruins, Hurricanes a few years back in that second round where no one could win on the road. And it was almost like a seven-game sweep. I know that makes no sense, but work with me here. By the Hurricanes over the Bruins that year. It's like they, those games aren't competitive. They had real no, ch- no real chance. And that's what I feel like I'm watching here. And the Knicks are now down to a nub. I thought this was going to be a problem for them anyway. To me, they mirror the Bridgie Celtics of about eight years ago. And that they're kind of overachieving. Brunson reminds me of uh, Isaiah Thomas then for the Celtics. Very similar. And sure. they've also played way, way, way too many minutes. Now, Hart lose, uh, leaves that game last night. Like Abdominal injury. He asked out and didn't play in the fourth quarter. I mean, that guy's tough as nails. If he's asking out, it's like, that's not great for them. They're done. They're done. And so that series has done very little for me. And I got news for you. Uh, and I know you might travel for the ECF as well, Chris. You guys are going to Indianapolis. <laughs> I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like it's going to be uh, Celtics Pacers starting on Tuesday night. Well, the Pacers are certainly the healthier team. And, and the Pacers are the number one offense in the postseason, and you look at the injuries with the Knicks, this Josh Hart one is obviously huge for them. But for me, the tipping point is really losing OG Ananobi. He makes them a different team. He's not their best player. Don't get me wrong. That's Brunson. But he was a guy that I think gave them a different look at the four, was a great defender, was able to give them some spacing as well, and a little bit more offense around them. Losing him, I think, has really hurt them in this series and now if they don't have heart if you're breaking up the nova Knicks part of it and these guys brunson's clearly not 100 percent either i mean you just look at that game and you're looking at some of the guys that they're playing in that game last night guys that are like part of the rotation alec burks is part of the rotation for them uh you're, you're seeing that you have to put him out there i like precious achua but you know, Deuce McBride's in the starting lineup for them and playing 35 minutes. He played pretty well, but still, these are all role players. Yeah, I just don't think that they have enough. And it's funny, someone emailed me yesterday after my Felger and Maz appearance, basically talking about, oh, it's not going to be a cakewalk for the Celtics. The Knicks play with so much edge, and uh, the Knicks are the NBA leaders in the postseason in offensive rebounds. So it's like, oh, they go after all these rebounds, and and I hear you, but I just don't think they're going to have anything, even if they win at at, at Madison Square Garden. I just don't think they're going to have anything left in the tank for the Celtics. They have emptied their tank 
just to get to the conference final. Either of these teams aren't aren't, aren't good enough. And so no, you, no, you, know, you want to call it spoiled? Go nuts. I, I really don't care. Label me however the hell you want. This is just, to me, I look at this and it's like, guys, wake me up on 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 june 6th like let let me get to the nba finals and i with everything that grandy was rattling off there as they wrapped up in five with cleveland this week you know and i get it like there's a lot of firsts there and then a lot of people want to look at this as a massive accomplishment to go to the eastern conference final six out of the last eight years it's three straight but to me like now's guys now's the time like you have to win now and i, I i'm willing to let them the celtics and celtics fans have some excuse making for the ones early on you're still dealing with lebron at the height of his powers oh yeah yeah uh, to me, the line of demarcation, guys, is, you know, when they get to the NBA final a few years back. Not even that. To me, the line of demarcation is 2020 in the bubble against Miami. You yeah. should have beaten them. And after the series, Ainge yeah. came on this radio station and said he felt like they were the more talented team. That was Danny Ainge who built the team. He felt like they were the more talented team and should have won the series. So for me, it's 2020. From that point, like that's the line where you start okay. losing. That's the line where it flips from. Hey, this is a great accomplishment to get there, and you're losing to like LeBron, and, and obviously the whole Kyrie thing didn't work out, and that team underachieved in 2019. But 2020, it's like you're the better team. Now you're starting to lose series you should win. Yeah, yeah. So, you see, I maybe I'm wrong to kind of give them a little bit of an excuse in that one too, because right, they ended up struggling with Toronto when they're up in that series. Maybe you do have to go back to that year because it's like okay, that was an odd one and it was a tough adjustment for a lot of guys sure. to be in that bubble. But no, that was an underachievement too. So maybe should have okay, won that series. I'm with you. Yeah, they should have won that one too. But they've run out of excuses now. And the way that this thing has been set up for them, again, if they end up playing the Pacers, if it went six, there's some size there. They've played the Celtics well. Like, I could get it. But to me, like, anything beyond that would be a massive disappointment, even if they end up going seven and still go to the final. You can't go seven with this Pacers team. They should wipe their ass with them. Yeah, I would. I, so I agree with you. I think the next series will go six instead of five. But you should still win. It, it, I would say it would be sort of the way Florida beat the Bruins, right? This is going six. It's close at times, but it's pretty clear which team is better. Yeah. That's the way I look at an Eastern Conference Finals with the Pacers. They might be able to steal more than one game in this because they do have a really good offense with uh, Rick Carlisle as the coach, Halliburton. Pascal Siakam is a guy that knows how to put the ball in the basket, and Miles Turner is a stretch big that can shoot some threes. Also, Aaron Neesmith, who was a Celtics draft pick, has become a pretty good little player for them. Uh, and it would be even more of a series if they had Benedict Matherin, but he's out for the year. But when you look at the, the setup of the Pacers, the problem is what they do best is score. But the Celtics, to me, still have more offensive firepower than them. Like, they're not going to beat the Celtics at their own game on offense, and the Pacers are not a good defensive team. The well-traveled Brian Robb back from Cleveland. Again, getting ready for his trip to uh, Indianapolis or New York. It'll be Indy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you were just telling us off the air, too, what, they got the Indy 500 there next weekend? Yeah, we got Indy 500 on Sunday, so flights and hotels for me and you, Gasper, are going to be uh, Ooh, a that's trip. Gonna be tough. Good luck with that. Get ready to stay bunk up at the Red Roof, you too. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so thoughts on the team is, uh, are you one that is like, you know, give the team their flowers. This is a massive accomplishment. Three Street Eastern, Eastern Conference Finals. I think there's been a lot of that from a lot of – uh, that cover the team, Celtics fans, uh, or is it just, you know, it's time to shut up and actually win this thing this year? They did their job. Like, let's, either direction. Like, this is, it would have been beyond disastrous if they had lost either of those two rounds, sure. even if either of those two teams were at full strength. Um, with that said, I give them credit for getting it done in five games in each series. It's like, that's something in the past. That is a important step forward for this team on a variety of fronts right now, particularly with, getting Al Horford rest, giving some more time for Porzingis, watching these other teams beat up on each other. That's something that you can tangibly measure here going forward, guys. Like, how much is this going to help them in the finals a couple weeks down the road? The fact that these two series and potentially the Eastern Conference Finals here is going to be uh, a cakewalk and not going to have to go the distance. Do you, are you concerned at all, either of you, about, you know, that? Like, look, they did their job. They should be cleaning up on these bum teams, especially when Donovan Mitchell, I think, is, like, backing out at the end here with that. Uh, what was it? Calf Ankle. injury. Calf. Calf injury yeah. yeah, it was calf injury. All right, so they're doing what they need to do. But is there some concern that they haven't been as battle tested going into the final if they ended up having to play a Minnesota, Denver, whoever? A little bit for me because it could it could be one of those things where you're not quite used to being pushed like that. I mean, they still haven't really. I love how people were talking about how they won a close game and played a close game in Game Four. They had a 15 point lead in the fourth quarter and they let it get you know down to what was it six. 
So, like, that's not the same as being in a game that's nip-tuck the whole way. Like, you have a 15-point cushion, and you just have to protect it, and then Jalen Brown hits the dagger three. They had basically, what was it, four minutes and 20-something seconds without a field goal. That's, that's like you made it a close game, and you're trying to hold on. That's not the same as being in a game where the, it's nip-and-tuck and, tuck and a, a team is pushing you. So my concern would be you get into that type of scenario or situation, which they haven't been great at this year in, in, in the NBA Finals, and you lose that game because you're not used to being in that scenario, and maybe the series goes seven, and you lose some margin for error there, and that ends up being the difference in the series that you early in the series kind of weren't used to that and lost a game that maybe you had won if you'd had some prior experience in the playoffs with that type of environment. I agree with that. I think the good news in that front, though, in my mind, in game five there, that was a three-point game with 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter, and the execution down the stretch where Tatum, Brown were finding open guys. Uh, those two guys had more assist and field goal attempts in the fourth quarter, and they just kind of picked the Cleveland defense apart. Again, you can't give them too much credit for that. They did it against Marcus Morris and, like, Sam Merrill. So it's like, okay, that's a far cry from um, Aaron Gordon and, and Jokic, uh, which could be coming up in a couple weeks. But that's important in terms of getting a taste of that and going away from what Casper said, instead of going blowing up 15-point lead, getting that down to six tight at the end, they went in the other direction to kind of close things out. And that's just something we haven't seen much from this team all year long. So that's why this, this kind of felt a little bit different this year. All right, your thoughts on the Celtics at 617-779-0985. You know who also has some? Draymond Green. I hate Draymond. Well, your best player doesn't. They're friends. Uh, but uh, he believes it's time for them to put up or shut up. We'll hear from Draymond Green and you at 617-779-0985. Coming up next here on the Sports Up Celtics Show. We'll have more of the Sports Hub Celtics show next. This is the 98.5 The Sports Hub Celtics show with Gasper and Murray on the Sports Hub. The Celtics advancing to the Eastern Conference Finals for the third straight year, and now this makes six times in the last eight years for this team, Kenny. Well, they... The two guys, you know, at some point people were saying they couldn't play together, but they're the winningest duo probably in the last five years in, in ba- NBA basketball. Um, so they figured it out. They continue to win. Now they have to win the big one and get to the finals and win it all. But they've done everything except that. Uh, and, and those two guys tenure together and adding pieces to it. And this is their best opportunity because of the talent around them. Kenny said they're the winningest duo over the last five years in basketball, and that's true, no one cares. Because they're no at No one that cares? Point, no one cares at all. They're at that point now to where you need to win a championship. Getting to the conference finals every year don't matter anymore. And how you know that they're at that point, because that's actually affecting Jason Tatum and MVP voting the last couple of years, because no one wants to see you win every year in the regular season, get to the conference finals, and then not finish the job. So this is good. Obviously, it's a step in the, on the way, but... No one cares that they're going back to the Eastern Conference Finals again. And he's right. At least in my opinion. Sports Up Celtic Show, Jim Murray, Chris Gath, for Brian Robb. And I know you hate hearing it. But to me, Draymond Green's right. It's time for Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown to win the whole thing. And fair or not, the perception is when you fall short of a title and you couldn't get it done, therefore you're a loser. And so here's an example. <laughs> No, so here's an example for it. So anytime, just keep it to the NBA, and that set. Anytime Shaq wants to bust Barkley's balls on That's that true. TNT set, his go-to insult isn't about his weight, his baldness. His go-to insult is the fact that Barkley never won a ring. Barkley's a Hall of Fame player, one of the greatest players of his era. Yeah, he was. Man, he was great. But the first thing his contemporaries like Shaq will say when they want to bust his balls is, "Oh, let's see your championship." Oh, never mind. Yeah, I know that's right. You don't have one. And now, Barkley even makes fun of it in that commercial where like he's talking to like his his younger self, yeah, talking to, like his you know future self, and he's like, "How many rings do I win?" You know, and he's like, "Oh, you don't want to know." So <laughs> that's for better or worse. I mean, a championship lasts forever. So it is falling short. And yeah. so if they don't want that label, this is the time. It's never been set up better for them. They're the best team. And if you want to keep throwing these things in my face, like these firsts again that Grandy was rattling off as they closed out that well, series. Well, they are interesting. I mean, they're interesting nuggets, you know, they for are. the season. They, I mean, they are interesting. But point differential and all of this, like, great, great. Close. I don't, it, now you need, to, you need to win now. This is the Yeah, time. it is an interesting dynamic, I think, with the Celtics. And I think it's a sort of a shifting dynamic you've seen over, I would say, maybe the last 38 years, you know, when you have two titles, 86 and 2008, 
which is because you weren't winning titles the way you were before, the dynamic has shifted uh, to sort of embrace everything that's happening right now and appreciate it, which for a normal franchise, well, yeah, I get it. Sure, cool. I mean, a normal franchise, six Eastern Conference Finals in eight years, let's celebrate. But this is the Boston Celtics. Right. This is a team that hangs banners for one thing and one thing only. This would be like the Yankees being like, we've gone to six ALCSs in the last yep. eight years. Do you think the Yankees would give a crap about that? No, no. The, the fans certainly. Do you think should, their fans like, would give a crap no, about that? No, no, they wouldn't. So it's like that's what's kind of I think shifted a little bit with Celtics fandom and, and the following of the team is it's like yeah, if you're just a run of the mill and NBA franchise, then absolutely you should be thrilled about this accomplishment. But when you're the Boston Celtics and it's all about championships and you have the best team, uh, you have if you're Jason Tatum and you're you know, top five, top six player in the league, you have the best supporting cast. I think. Of, of anybody, it's time. It's time to get it done. It's time to win a championship. And in fairness to them and in fairness to Grandy as well, it's like, well, they can't win a championship in the second round. So you have to talk about, because this is part of my frustration too, sometimes honestly covering these games and writing about them. It's like, okay, I went to this game. I want to write about what happened. And it's all like, well, you should write about whether they've won a champion. They're going to win the championship or write about. And it's like, okay, but this game did like happen. Yeah. Can we acknowledge this game for like 30 seconds? Can we acknowledge what Horford did? Can we acknowledge they closed? So I think that's the other side of it. You, you, you can't answer these questions in round one or two. Uh, Don and Carver with a thought on what Draymond Green had to say. What's up? Hi, this is for the most literate sports show on the dial. Uh, the word for today is sobriquet. And uh, the example is the word chum. So when, when young kids were playing on the streets in South Boston, stickball, uh, they were uh, they were chums. Their friends played with them. Chums is no longer, it should have been written out of the dictionary. No one uses the word chums anymore. Fast forward yeah, now. Sure the Bruins to, were chum for the Florida Panthers. <laughs> yeah, right. Chumps? No, no, this is chum. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, fast forward to Charles Barkley and Draymond Green, the new pairing on uh, the uh, TNT after shows. Um, when is the explosion going to happen? Uh, go to DraftKings and put your money down as to when it's going to happen, the in-studio craziness and the volatility of both uh, both gentlemen, shall we say. Um, it's going to happen. Oh, well, I don't know about that. I think they're just busting balls. I, I thought Draymond was a great fit on that set. It is interesting, like Draymond, but Draymond does get under people's skin. I could see Shaq being, I could see, and Draymond can dish it out, but he can't take it. So I could totally see Shaq, you know, Draymond making some comment about Shaq winning because of Kobe and Shaq coming back and being like, you're the greatest sidecar in NBA history, you know, <laughs> and then Draymond yeah. loses his mind. You know, I could see it getting a little ugly. Like, you know what I mean? Michael in the car next on the sports of Celtic show. Hey, Michael. Hey, just a quick thing about um, being able to win after, after being rested in the eighties, the Lakers played almost nobody except, except Houston twice and lost. And they were, they were in the finals all the time. So I don't think that makes them not ready to play. So the yeah, it, oh, it depends. I mean, it, you know, it. De de I, I guess on the rest thing, like I'm not so much saying about rest. Um, I, this has come up. The Lakers, you know, some of the Lakers' paths in the '80s were pretty easy to the finals. Uh, but in terms of the rest thing, I'm just saying if you haven't played close games. So I don't think we said anything about like the rest factor of having to wait till Tuesday to play. My concern would be in the NBA finals, not the Eastern Conference finals, that if you haven't been pushed and you haven't played close games, we absolutely had to execute down the stretch to win the game that could cost you a game in the finals. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, we won three, but that game we lost early on when we weren't really used to playing that way. Oh, that ended up costing us the series and the title. Yeah. But the rest thing right now, I think is good for them because it helps them, you know, still ease Chris Tapps Porzingis back, which by the way, now that again, the Pacers and Knicks are going to seven, I would not try to rush him back for this Eastern conference final. There's been some talk of that. And I know he's been shooting around like, I don't. I frankly don't want to see Porzingis in this series. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Oh, I want to see him in this series. You do? Yeah, I do. I want to see him in this series so they can get completely calibrated and tuned going into the NBA Finals. For the same reason I just mentioned about not being used to playing in close games. Again, if you're, if you're trying to ramp up or get back to playoff caliber basketball in the NBA, it could take a game or two, and then it could cost you a game or two. So it seems like, you know, B-Rob, all the reporting is coming out from Woj, 
And I have to give the Jimmy Stewart disclaimer on Woj and the Celtics. As Jimmy correctly points out, Woj is a legend. He's one of the best. But his stuff on the Celtic yeah, tends to be a little shaky. Um, says he won't play the first two games of the Eastern Conference Finals. Where do you think KP is in terms of trending to get back? Yeah, I expect to see him in the latter end of this series. Um, but I do wonder, to Jim's point, if they go up 2-0 and he's still at like 90-ish percent, I put, I keep him on ice. If, and, if, if they sweep, do you think you, we – let's say it's a four-game sweep. Do you think he plays in any of the games? Maybe. I Honestly, no. Okay. I think at that point that you, you just do it because for as much as you want to calibrate him to your point guys to get him ready to go, I think his – durability issues over the course of his career where if he comes back too soon and then just twists another ankle or just does something else and then he's he's done done at that point and i think you don't need him to get past the knicks or the pacers no matter what so if you can buy the extra two weeks of rest get him ramped up with the training staff know that there might be a little bit of rust but he's done that a lot this year and when he's come back from you know five ten game absences he's looked pretty good I would I would roll the dice of that more than just get him out there for the the experience. His physical fragility has weighed him down his whole career. Like, let's not push this thing. And true. so you're at you know you're on the road covering him. How's he look? You've been some of these shoot arounds. Like, what can you tell us in terms of how he's looked? Yeah. So we we, we saw him work out twice. Um, I'd say it's Gin- gingerly. I mean, yeah. he's like he ran through some. You know, we were talking like thirty percent speed, like pick and roll drills and. He's playing some defense there, and he was moving more, but it's also like he wasn't jumping to contest anything yet. So that was, um, you know, probably a week ago at this point where we saw him do that, and it, it times out of being like he looked like he was going to be at best like two weeks away from coming back, and that's what it's looking like at this point. All right, your thoughts on the Celtics as they await to see who they're going to play in the Eastern Conference Finals that uh, will tip off Tuesday night at TD Garden. Pacers, Knicks still have to play a Game 7, but the Knicks are basically down to a nub as they've been beat to hell, more injuries. Uh, and so I think it's going to end up being the Pacers. You want to weigh in on that? 617-779-0985. And what about giving Jason Tatum his flowers? There's been a lot of that. This week. Give him his flowers. Give him his flowers. Well, Chris has a bouquet ready. I do. And I he, do. He will do just that. When we come back in the Sports Up Celtics show next. Stay tuned for more of the Sports Up Celtics show. Um. The Boston Celtics play here. For a 50 piece. This is. The Sports Hub Celtics show on the Sports Hub. What did you want to say about the Celtics? They're the worst offense I've seen for grown folks. Is it like, <laughs> like it's like they had, it's like they just get a ball to one guy and go one on one. They win a lot of games because they got talent, but there's it's like I'm like what are they doing? It's like hey Jason, you get to the top of the key, go one on one, shoot a step back three. Jalen, you go back there, you make a move. Everybody just stands around. It's frustrating. I don't. Uh, maybe some things will change when Porzingis come back, but the way they play offense right now, they're not. They can't win a championship like that. Chuck, I'm gonna go right into what you were saying because this is live time. So he has the ball. They'll freeze it here. We got one guy in the corner. One guy here, one guy up. Now we're going to go live. Let me see how long he stands in there. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 1,011. All right, you can count. Like, this is what I'm saying. The guy stands in the corner for 14 seconds, Shaq. And that is that not shot, Kenny. Same thing over there again. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,000. Who stands in the corner for 15 seconds in every offense and you expect to get shots, good shots? And in a closeout game, these are the type of shots that you're getting and they try to get it again. Still in the corner, still in the corner, no movement, no ball movement, no body movement. When you're, be- when you're the better team, no, I'm not going to write it down. I'm not going to write it down. <laughs> but when you're the better team, you have to get movement, you want activity, and you want possessions to be at a frequency. You don't want to have less possessions yeah, against you, a team. You led the Cavaliers to rest on defense. 100%. That's crazy. The TNT crew ragging on the Celtics offense as they wrap up the Cavs in five. Sports Up Celtics show. Jim Murray, Chris Gasper, Brian Rob, you, 617-779-0985. Is that an unfair assessment? I, I think it is an unfair assessment because, you know, look, those guys know more about basketball than I do. But there were things that the Celtics 
were trying to do there in terms of make it difficult for Evan Mobley to help and also create situations where they got the cross matches and mismatches that they wanted to and take advantage of Darius Garland, which they were able to do. It's not, it doesn't always look pretty. And I do get frustrated with the five out and sometimes it's just way too stagnant. But I thought in the fourth quarter, uh, what are these, I mean, what are these guys talking about? They shot 64% in the fourth quarter. Drew holiday was five for five and scored 11 of his 13 points. Missoula made an adjustment there where instead of just playing the normal five out, there were times holiday was in the corner, but he was kind of like, you know, roaming, Baseline to baseline. Sometimes he was in the short corner or like the dunker spot. There were other times he was kind of in the paint, almost replacing because they had pulled Horford out. Horford out. It's almost like he was sort of acting as the big guy. He would cut and be in the paint. And they got some really great shots off of that. So I'm I'm not really sure what those guys are talking about. Their offensive rating in the series against Cleveland for all the resting that Cleveland was able to do on defense with guys standing in the corner. The offensive rating for the Celtics in that series was 120.2. That means they scored, you know, it's 120.2 points per 100 possessions. That's really, really good. I mean, that would be the highest in the playoffs if you extrapolated it out over the entire postseason. So I disagree with these guys. I think it's not – here's what I will say. I understand why they don't like it because it's not fun to look at. That's for damn sure. But it was effective. All right. You have your bouquet ready. Do you want to give Jason Tatum his flowers? Yeah, you look. You know, I I was pretty hard on Jason Tatum, and and first the first thing I'll say is I don't take any of that back, rightfully so, because he proved me right that he can play better than he was playing, he can shoot better than he was shooting, and still do the other things that people were using as excuses or shields to deflect from the fact that he wasn't playing efficient offensively or wasn't playing up to the superstar standard with his offense when he was averaging you know twenty one points per game and shooting like thirty nine percent from the field. So the last three games. He's averaged 30.3 points per game. He's shooting 47% from the field. That game the other night to close out the series against Cleveland, that was his best shooting game of the postseason so far. He was 9 of 16 from the field. He shot really well. And you say, oh, but you know, he's doing all these other things. Okay, well, the last three games where he looked like Jason Tatum, and by the way, I don't need him to average 30 points a game. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, 21 on 39% shooting, yeah, you're better than that, or you should be. If you're, you know, if we're, you're going to get MVP chance, but the last three games, so 30.3, his boards, his in assist, 11.3 and 6.7. That's actually higher than what he was averaging in the prior seven games. And everybody was like, oh, you're a casual. You're just watching the score. You don't understand. He's doing all these other things. The other seven, he was averaging 10 rebounds and 5.4 assists. So yes, Jason Tatum as a superstar can actually walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah, the Tatum discourse is getting to be a bit much. I, I just don't see why it's so difficult for a lot of fans to call a bad night a bad night. I, you, you nailed know? it, yeah. They're much much better brevity than me, but that, that's my problem. Yeah, and so you you thought he could be better. He was better. What's wrong with that? Well, this sort of goes <laughs> just... back to what you said before about the way the team is consumed and is sometimes presented by the media, which is like everything is awesome, everything is great. And so that's what ends up happening when he's not – you know, he wasn't playing, like, horribly, yeah. but he wasn't playing well by the superstar standard. But it's like, well, we can't say that because everything with the Celtics is awesome and always great and the team's always the best. And, you know, let's wear these green-eyed glasses. So we're going to sit here and say, well, he's not scoring because he's doing these other things. But now when he's scoring at a really high level and doing these other things, you don't hear a peep other than, whoa, Tatum's great. So it's like when he's not playing well, he's great. Now when he's actually is playing great, he's still great. So how can you actually define greatness if you tell me he's playing great all the time, no matter what he does in every game? Yeah, it's pretty annoying. Yeah, he's always great because he's our guy. Like, no, guys, it's okay to say if he had a bad night here and there. Uh, Speaking of, so like Al Horford erupted game five. Yeah. Uh, Prior to that, I thought both he and Derek White started to show some fatigue, maybe, or some trepidation a little bit, even for White, who had been awesome. But I felt like maybe, I don't know, maybe minutes are starting to add up here. Uh, what else has stood out to you in this series? I know it could be a little bit tough because, again, given the competition, but um, I feel like you thought Joe Missoula had a good series. I did think Joe Missoula had a, a pretty good – I thought he outcoached J.B. Bickerstaff. Some of the stuff we just talked about with being able to – and B-Rob, feel free to jump in here. You neutral, neutralized Mobley as a defender, and, and I liked what they did. You know, Jared Weiss or the Athletic wrote this story about – taking away the threes in game five without Mitchell because Cleveland was playing a different way. I I feel like in the past, Joe's been maybe kind of slow 
to make adjustments or react on a given night mm-hmm. because he knows that overall the data says, okay, like Marcus Morris won't be able to repeat this, so we're just going to do what we do. Eventually he's going to miss. I thought this was good where he adjusted in this specific game and said, okay, no, we're going to change our strategy in this specific game. We are going to do more switching. We're going to have guys act like they're going over and sort of drop. We're going to do these other things. And I thought his adjustments were really good. I like the way he used his timeouts in the series, particularly in game five to stem momentum. I thought that was important. Like, for example, in the third, Cleveland had cut a 12-point deficit to six. He calls a timeout with 3.53 left in the third after Tatum grabs a defensive rebound, right, of a Garland missed three that would have cut it to three. They come out of that timeout. They run good offense that has Tatum in the post. Tatum gets double, tripled, kicks it out to Peyton Pritchard for an open three. They hit that three and kind of push back on the Cavs. So I like what I saw from Missoula in this series. I feel like I feel more confident about him based on the way he's coached this postseason than probably at any point in in his Celtics head coaching tenure. B Rub? I'd agree. I wrote about Missoula after game five. Like the the, the timeout stuff you nailed there. Like, Feels like he's proactive as opposed yeah. to reactive. Yeah, I agree. This postseason run, and that is huge. That's what you want in terms of for a team in Game Five that came out lacking energy. He was calling ten timeouts left and right to try to try to get them going, and then and then eventually all came together in the fourth quarter. Another thing I'm looking at playoff wise here, guys. Jalen Brown is shooting 55 percent from the field in the playoffs so far. Yeah, but B Rob, how many turnovers? Does I he mean. Have? Only two. He's got point seven more turnovers per game than Jason Tatum. So. Yeah, but but you don't understand, B. Rob. <laughs> Tatum has the a higher usage rate and the ball in his hands. You can't trust him at the free throw line. What are the turnovers per usage rate or per possession, B. Rob? Listen, Jalen Brown. I know we don't have to worry about Jalen Brown this show not getting a, a fair shake, but correct. Uh, his consistency has stood out, and just the to be able to score twenty three points per game in the playoff and shoot that efficiently. Through 10 games. I don't care who you're playing. That's damn impressive. So you get that from him. And on top of the other guy who's I think is really balling out so far in the playoffs, Payne Pritchard has been great in, in that calf series. Maybe not so much in game five, but hitting big threes, being a legitimate six man uh, when they needed him with Porzingis out. That's been a nice little boon for the bench. Well, so you don't understand, B Rob. You have to understand this is how it works with the Celtics. Both of those guys, Brown and Pritchard, Oh, all of their points to Tatum. It's his <laughs> yeah. offensive gravity that allows okay. those guys to be as efficient as they are. My so, mistake. So, you know, he's kind of like like he is the positive energy version of a black hole. And so all these other guys, like all their points, every basket they've ever scored is because Tatum's on the team. My mistake. I'm yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I mean, you got to credit that. I mean, I can't even believe they let you cover NBA games. Yeah, how dare you don't, you, you yeah. don't know this, and you're not aware of this gravity stat. You know, gravity per possession for Tatum is the highest I think in the history of the NBA. All right, coming up, long commercial free segment. Your calls the rest of the way. A couple open lines. You want to join us? Uh, give us your expectation for the Celtics. Who do you want to see him play in the final? Because let's be honest, the Eastern Conference Final is just going to be a formality. Whether it's the Knicks or the Pacers, they still have to play that game seven. They'll be beat up. It should be Celtics in six at. At worst, uh, especially if it's uh, the Knicks, who I think are just too decimated to even give them much of a uh, much of a push. So, who would you like to see in the final? Six one seven 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 nine zero ninety eight five. We'll wrap up with your calls next. You're listening to the ninety eight five The Sports Hub Celtics Show. Everything basketball. It's a three. Got it. Pull up three. Peter to block the shot from behind, and the heat is on. The Sports Hub Celtics Show. Welcome back to Sports of Celtics show. Wrapping things up. Now's the time to weigh, on, uh, weigh in on the Celtics. They have the looming Eastern Conference Final, which will tip off Tuesday night against either the Indiana Pacers or the New York Knicks. To me, that'll be another series much like these last two against uh, Cleveland and Miami. That will be a formality. So uh, who do you want to see them face in the final? Uh, who is left? We have Oklahoma City. We have Dallas. Dallas can close out OKC tonight, up 3-2 in that series. you get got a Game 7 between Minnesota and Denver. Uh, and while that series, we were talking about that guys off air a little bit earlier. You know, it's been entertaining, but uh, you know, when you really look at it, thirty thousand feet, that uh, every game's kind of been a blowout. <laughs> like it's, there's a lot of star power there. It's been fun to watch, but really hasn't been all that competitive. It was kind of a no show and a quit by Denver in Game Six. We get the Game Seven there. Who's the Who's the ideal matchup? Who do you want to see? Just in terms of being able to write about it, talk about it, like. I don't know. Give me like what's the 
That's that's two different questions. I suppose. yeah, it is like, two different questions. Who's the best? Uh, who do the, who should the Celtics want? Who do you want? Okay, uh, so who should the Celtics want? I think the Celtics should want Dallas because I think Kyrie mentally, you know, playing at the Garden could be an issue for him. Luca's had like a million injuries this postseason. Uh, PJ Washington's played well for them, but they don't have a real third star. Just quickly on the Luca injury thing, yeah. too. If if we covered that team here, I, I would not stop talking about how he needs to shut up about that. Like he just needs to let you know I'm hurt. Like shut that up. That is dude. true. I thought you were going to so say annoying. I thought you were going to say if we covered him here, we wouldn't stop talking about how he's still. What is this year? Whatever for him is still not in shape. Well, that too. I think. I mean, come on, man. So if you want to whine about your injuries, I don't know. How about drop ten pounds? Yeah, he looks like, like a chain smoking European just exactly. pulled off a beach. Yeah, <laughs> lay off the tequila, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, I, you keep wondering why you get hurt, but I'd say Dallas uh, I, I would be that uh, ideal matchup. Uh, I look at the other teams. You know, obviously Denver's Denver. Minnesota still has some size. Even Oklahoma City. I just think Shea Gilgis Alexander just has some of that dog in him in a good way, which is not good for the Celtics. And they also have some size with Holmgren, uh, which is not good for the Celtics. So I would say Dallas. And then the one, you know, from a coverage standpoint, Denver. Defending champions. Uh, I think that's the marquee matchup. If from a coverage standpoint, you want to see the two best teams, I think those are the two best teams. B Rub? I would say, um, I agree with Chris. Like Dallas, I think, is the most favorable matchup, matchup wise for the Celtics at this point, especially. They're mix, mixing another big guy, Kleber, too, for them. That would bode well for the Celtics on that front. Um, for, honestly, storyline angles, though, I honestly think Dallas might be more compelling than Denver. I think Denver, Ooh. like, they, they have the effect. But, like, the Kyrie return here, like, five years later after this, with the way he's playing, he's trying defensively. He's giving it his all, like, all stuff he really didn't do in Boston. You throw that in with with Luca, maybe the Celtics put Grant Williams courtside for these games to, to, to chirp the Dallas Rocks. There's, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of ammo there. From how, the how would that? How, how, how would that work? Two teams that hate Grant. Williams. Yeah, right. Yeah. Just put no, them, just kidding. Put them up. In, just put them up. Put them up in the three hundreds and occasionally throw them. You know, the, you know what they the should build. do? Because our guy, love legend, love you. Mike Gorman has been at these games. They should seat Grant next to Mike Gorman. <laughs> oh, that's right. Mike uh, would probably get a better seat. Uh. I didn't hear either you say Minnesota, though, in terms of, oh. you know, like that the, being able to talk about it, like Anthony yeah. Edwards. Like, I, I don't know. I would find that there. Yeah, I would find that to be interesting. The Denver thing, I think, is what we should all want, though. Like a Denver Celtics matchup, the two best teams. I also kind of feel like if they beat Denver, it it attenuates the idea of they had an easy path. Like, maybe you had an easy path there, but if you beat the yeah, defending NBA yeah. champions, it's a no-questions-asked NBA title. Whereas if you get one of these other teams, I feel like people are going to be like, well, you know, you had an easy path all the way through. And, like, Denver – I'm sorry, Minnesota eliminated Denver for you or this, blah, blah, blah. Or Oklahoma City's like, really young. Or, you know, Luca looks like a chain-smoking Euro on a beach in Italy. Like, there's going to be something else yep. there that people are going to use against you. And by people, I mean Felger and Maz. And so I feel like if it's Denver and you beat them, you beat Jokic, you beat the defending champs, it's like – all questions answered. Yeah, a title's a title, so I'm not going to maz it and say it would be a lesser than. Like to me, a title's a title, no matter how they, you end up getting it. Even if it was an easier path, I wouldn't asterisk it. But yeah, you're right. Like you beat Denver, that shuts everybody up because you know there would be some national talking heads or even those guys yeah. saying like, "Well, I mean, come on." Yeah, it's like all the injuries. Yeah. You know, the Celtics uh, had all these injuries that helped them, and then they didn't have to face the best team. You beat Denver and win this championship. I think that insulates Tatum and Brown pretty much forever from people, you know, knocking them, saying you can't win the big one, saying, you know, you don't have the winning DNA. If you win that, you win that championship by beating those guys. And I'll say this right now. I think whoever wins game seven, Minnesota, Denver, they're coming out of the West. I don't think Dallas, I don't, I mean, Dallas will put up some of a fight, but I think those are two of the best teams by far in the West right now. I think OKC, we've kind of seen their warts right now as a young team, um, Josh Giddy has disappeared for them. Gordon Hayward may not play in the NBA next year. <laughs> like, I was going to say, man, Gordon, you, you know, uh, Gordon Hayward, what is happening? I don't He's know. Like the witness protection program out there. Like, holy crap for, for a guy who was, was making $35 million. Like that's score one for Danny Ainge. I can get that contract right now. Cause 
Hayward uh, at the end of it looks like he can barely get up the floor at this point. Yeah, it's you know maybe shame on me, but I I just think it's like OKC and Dallas is afterthoughts. I just think it's Minnesota or Denver. Like really, I mean, yeah, I really. Don't. And and also I have an OKC bias because that is the nerdiest team in all. I know of you said that. Yeah, um, you're gonna say that's awesome. You said that team leads the league in nerds. Uh, you seen the post game stuff, Jim? Like what they do for it, every interview? It, it, it just bothers me to no end. That in the the what a pro wants commercial. I I, I just hate them so much. Like they they they're just geeks. Like I. I, I I, the post game stuff. It's just if you don't know what we're talking about, you can find it on Twitter or all over social media. They're just nerds. Like I, I, I so I, I don't know, man. I kind of feel like Chet Holmgren looks like a young Jim Murray, tall, uh, gangly. Uh, no, I wasn't that gangly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Are you trying to say you were cooler than that? Yes. Yeah, I at least was a little bit more self aware than Chet Holmgren. How about that? God, you didn't man. have the gold chain like Chet Holmgren. That does? what a pro wants is. <laughs> Whoever came up with that should be put in prison. That that commercial is so bad, and the fact that those two they were into it too, like they, so they're to blame too. It's not just the the ad exec that came up with the. Oh God, do I hate them? Well, you know, SGA's Canadian, so like he's and nice. maybe he gets a pass because so, he's so Canadian. He's they're nice, kinda, so he's like he's they're like, corny by nature. I think SGA is like, oh, this is a terrible idea, but I'm Canadian, so yeah. I'm not going to tell him it's a terrible idea. I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to do it. And then Holmgren, I think, feels like, oh, man. This is my time yeah. to shine. Well, I think he's pretty much like, oh, man, this is definitely going to pump up my swag rating. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> uh, your calls the rest of the way. Mike in the car on the Celtics expectations going forward. Go ahead, Mike. What's going on, guys? Uh, Jim, I just wanted to say I really like how much of not a hater you are, but your realism towards the Celtics because I can't stand how certain people talk about the team and I keep a similar mindset. Uh, all I was going to say is, I think that the way the Celtics were successful with the Bridgie Celtics makes everyone kind of have a biased view because of how successful that team was with the lack of talent and how they had to play much harder to get to where they got. What do you think of that, Chris? And thanks, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I think go. he's right. I think he's right. And, and that was, the that was to me, was the defining characteristic or I should say the defining flaw of the Bridgie Celtics it, 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 their greatest strength was their greatest weakness. They played so hard. And so in the regular season, that benefited them because they were able to exceed their talent level. The problem is you get into the postseason, well, everybody's playing hard now. So that advantage dissipates. Yeah. And now it becomes about the talent, and you just didn't have enough of it. But I do think, yes, people, Celtics fans fell in love with those teams. And I think, to the credit of Celtics fans, they have always loved and always rewarded hustle guys in effort. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But I do think sometimes we get to a point where we glorify it to a degree of it being unrealistic and you start looking at, you know, it's all about, oh, this guy's going to win the Tommy Award or the Tommy Point. And it's like, he's just a guy. You know, he, it, it's, it's, he's just a role player guy who is fungible and replaceable. And if he were in another uniform, you'd forget all about him. Dean and Shrewsbury on the Celtics offense. Go ahead, Dean. The offense doesn't have to be pretty. It has to be effective. This five-out ISO thing has worked because of our, the talent we have on the roster. It's led to the best offense of all time. And don't you guys know everything is awesome? Everything is cool when you're part of the team. <laughs> everything is awesome when you're when you're living out a dream. Yeah, that is the Thank Celtic you. experience. In fact, you know what? I like that. I like the way Dean did. I want to get Dean and Chet Holmgren to do a duet of singing "Everything Is Awesome." Yeah, I think I'd, I'd be into that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Chris and Easton uh, with uh, Draymond Green's comments on the Celtics. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, I, you know, I'm a Celtics fan, but I, I think I think Draymond Green is – I think that guy's gold. I think he's got the highest IQ. You know, I don't know if you heard last year when the Celtics won game six with the tip-in, you know, with D, yep. D White. Derek White. Uh, the next day, Derek White, the next day, Draymond Green says, they're going to lose this series because they acted like game six was game seven. And he was right. And even when um, – they lost game, you know, when Golden State lost game one of the finals, he started counting how many um, threes that the team got. He's like, we're good. We're going to be good. And he was right. He's one of these guys. He, ha- he gets it. He, whether you love him or hate him, I would love him on this team. He, he's just smart. And he knows. So when he says that about the Celtics, nobody cares. I'm 100% on his side. Okay. He, Draymond does. Draymond's blunt. 
And he has a high basketball IQ, so the caller's not wrong. You can continue to weigh in on uh, anything Celtics-related if you'd like. We've got one hour to go on Gasper and Murray. We'll reset on the uh, Bruins' loss last night in Game 6. That's it. Playoff hockey can no longer hurt me by the Bruins the rest <laughs> of the way. Uh, we'll touch on that and uh, some of the other stuff that we wanted to get to. Patriots schedule coming out. Uh, this uh, Scheffler story down in Louisville. We'll get to that, uh, among other things, here in the final hour. Gasper and Murray here on 98.5 Sports Hub.